So we're nearly at the end of this chapter. I'll just read rather quickly the last page here. The line of continuity between the gardens of the spirit, the heart and the soul, represented by the unbroken flow of water between them, is none other than the intellect. A line of continuity between the garden of the spirit, the garden of the heart, the garden of the soul, this line of continuity is nothing other than the intellect, the unbroken flow of water between them. But the pure intellect may not be said to descend lower than the garden of the heart. So why does he say it stops at the heart? Why does the intellect come from the essence down to the spirit, then to the heart? And then he says, but it doesn't go any further than the heart. Why not? As to the waters which flow between the two lowest fountains, that is the garden of the heart and the soul, they, they represent those intellectual faculties in which the intellect has become partially veiled by the psychic substance. So now this psyche, this soul, psychic substance, <clears throat> the individuality, the character, the personality, everything that makes me, me. This is an individual coagulated substance of psychic coagulations. All of this stuff of which I am made, unfortunately, veils the intellect. So those intellectual faculties in which the intellect has become partially veiled by the psychic substance. These are the faculties of intellectual intuition. And they are the mediators between the reason which rules the soul and the pure intellect which rules the heart. So in between the soul and the heart, the soul is dominated by reason and the psychic substance. The heart is dominated by the intellect. But between the two, there are these intellectual intuitions, but they're partially veiled by what's streaming up from below. It's like uh, you know, the opposite of the downward flow of fountains. It's like the gushing up of all this psychic rubbish that is actually veiling the intellect, the intellectual intuitions that are partially connecting the realm of the soul with the realm of the heart, this is view and danger. And this is where the Jihad al-Akbar takes place, precisely in that intermediate domain and on the level of the soul. These are the faculties of intellectual intuition, and they are the mediators between the reason which rules the soul and the pure intellect which rules the heart. Their knowledge is more certain than that of the law, the ilm al but less certain than that of the eye, the Ain al yaqeen So the Ain al yaqeen is higher, the Ilm al yaqeen is lower, these intellectual intuitions are in the middle. They may also be called the heavenly desires, since they are turned in spontaneous inclination towards the next world, just as desires in the ordinary meaning are turned towards this world. So ordinary desires in the soul that are turned to this world are ones that lead away from these intellectual intuitions. But when those desires are turned towards God and the hereafter, they move in the right direction, even though they're still partially veiled by the psychic substance. So their intellectual intuitions in that respect they are oriented towards the true, but insofar as they are partially veiled by the desires and the other things of the psychic substance, they are uh, dragged down towards desires of this world. In one sense, these intermediary waters form part of the garden of the soul, which is in fact incomplete without them, depending upon them for its fountain, which is its most essential feature. It is thus made up of two kinds of elements, of intu intuitive faculties which are turned in desire towards the garden of the heart, 
and which are perpetually satisfied by the light which comes from it, and of earthly desires which are turned towards the particular objects of perception in the outer world, and which are ready to be satisfied according to the possibilities afforded by outward conditions. It is, in fact, this readiness to be satisfied, this full development, and not the actual satisfaction itself, which distinguishes the soul of the true man from that of the fallen man. Indeed, it may be that the earthly desires are only satisfied within certain limitations. Now, here we have a footnote. The garden of the soul depends for its full realization on the perfection of the fruit as well as on that of the fountain, so that in a sense it is only possible for the true man to possess fully the garden of the soul during his life if he is living in the Garden of Eden, that is, during the primordial age. Otherwise, this paradise may only be enjoyed to the full after death, when the perfect soul is said to abide in a prolongation of the earthly state, which is like itself incorporeal and not subject to decay, retaining always its primordial perfection. The term garden of the soul is in fact usually taken to refer to such a prolongation of the human state after death. So you see, what he's saying here is that it's the readiness to be satisfied by particular objects that distinguishes the true man's state of realization from a actual satisfaction of all of these desires on the plane of the soul, because the actual satisfaction presupposes a perfection in what would be the Garden of Eden, where everything outwardly is satisfying every need for satisfaction inwardly. And that is the paradisal possibility, so that on earth, the true man, as, as Dr. Lins is referring to here, what distinguishes the soul of the true man from that of the fallen man is in fact the readiness to be satisfied and not the actual satisfaction itself because earthly desires are only satisfied within certain limitations. The objects may not be there in the actual earthly realm. So it's only in the Garden of Eden that all of the outward objects satisfy the inward need that we have for satisfaction in the soul. So I'll just read that again, the, the footnote. The garden of the soul depends for its full realization on the perfection of the fruits as well as on that of the fountain. So it is only possible for the true man to possess fully the garden of the soul during his life if he is living in the garden of Eden. So the Garden of Eden has the fruits as well as the fountains. The fountains are spiritual perception, spiritual knowledge, light that relates the particular back to universal. But the fruits, the actual things, the particular objects, to be there to satisfy the soul, in actual satisfaction, they will not be there in this fallen world. They will only be there in the Garden of Eden. But this does not apply to the heavenly leanings of the intuitive faculties. This is the last sentence now. But this does not apply to the heavenly leanings of the intuitive faculties. Remember those intu intuitions that connect the realm of the soul dominated by reason and the realm of the heart dominated by the intellect. What is in between these two are intellectual aspirations, leanings, desires for heaven, for God. So what he's saying here is that this does not apply to the heavenly leanings, what he has said. Let me just reread this last 
sentence before so we can get this contrast clearly in our minds. And then I think after this, we'll stop there and um, we'll have one question. But um, as you can probably hear, my voice is giving out on me now and I, I need to go and get a drink. Um, it is, in fact, this readiness to be satisfied, this full development, and not the actual satisfaction itself, which distinguishes the soul of the true man from that of the fallen man. Indeed, it may be that the earthly desires are only satisfied within certain limitations. But this does not apply to the heavenly leanings of the intuitive faculties. And still less does it apply to the garden of the heart itself, which is above all earthly conditions, being even above death, as the name of its fountain shows. <clears throat> So still less does it apply to the garden of the heart, which is above all earthly conditions, being even above death, as the name of its fountain shows. Now, I don't know what the name, because in so far as I remember in the Surah Ar-Rahman, the names of the fountain, it just says that the two fountains are gushing. So maybe that's what... It means that it's the gushing nature, the, the fountain of immortality. It's permanently gushing forth with life. So it's above death. And these heavenly leanings of the intuitive faculties are, as it were, they're all, they will always find their satisfaction in the measure that that heavenly aspiration prevails over the veil constituted by the individuality, the psychic substance imposing itself upon the, the heavenly desires. But those intuitions, and this is, I suppose, a, a good point at which to end in terms of a practical point, our soul being dominated by reason, our heart is dominated by the intellect, but in terms of practical spirituality, what we are constantly doing in orienting our meditation, our reflection towards the gardens. Oh, thank you very much. So, I needed some water yeah, from, so. yeah. from the fountain of immortality. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so on, to end on a practical note where we are in our current situation as um, seekers of the heart our reason that dominates our soul is also allied to our imagination our intuition and our memory, the four faculties of the soul. And the intuition is the bridge that enables us to go from the level of knowledge fashioned by the soul to the level of knowledge opened up by the heart, the fountain of the, the heart, the fountain of spiritual knowledge, wherein the, the light of the moon, reflecting the light of the sun from the spirit, is shining down on us. And one thing I'd like to finish on, a note I'd like to finish on here, is what Dr. Linz used to say about the Quranic descriptions of paradise. He said that these descriptions are marvelous and they are more, you might say, detailed than in any other scripture of revelation. But he said it's almost as if these descriptions of paradise are there in order to allow the imagination to 
open out to them, to focus upon those images. Remember, imagination and image. The images of paradise are there for the imagination of the soul to work upon, to reflect upon, to meditate upon, and to open up the whole, the totality of the soul to the beauty of the images being revealed by God for this dimension of the soul. And one might add that it's one of the reasons that one of the reasons why these descriptions of paradise, these images of paradise, make such a profound spiritual impact upon our soul is precisely because of what Dr. Lins is talking about in this book, that the gardens depicted in the Quran, the gardens of paradise, different degrees and levels of paradise, are all to be found within the degrees of depth of our own heart and spirit. So this is why we recognize, not just recognize, we recognize with our heart what we've already known, because we were, and in a certain sense are, in our innermost reality, we are still in that paradise from which we've only fallen in appearance. And so the soul, with all of its psychic complications, being dominated by reason, nonetheless has openings through imagination and intuition, and not just memory in the ordinary empirical sense, but memory in the sense of thikr, of a kind of supracognitive recollection of what we were, what we still are in our inmost, step, inmost depths. And that's why the descriptions of paradise coming from revelation reveal to us or uncover for us, disclose for us, it's a kind of cash, al-mahjul. It is a disclosure of what is covered over by a hijab, the hijab of the nafs. And so that revelation reveals, reminds, recollects, discloses, uncovers what we already know to be our true inmost reality. If only we could liberate ourselves from the veils with which we falsely identify ourselves, the veils of this individuality, this desire, this imagination, speculation, whatever else it may be. So I, I'll stop on that note, and um, I, I think uh, the Fraser, uh, because I know that the um, the forty minutes. Fall, no, not just that. The break and fast very uh, very soon. Oh, you're breaking the other fast. Side. What time are you breaking fast? This is just an hour left, I think. So maybe we can. Yes, but we can continue if you want. Pardon? We can continue if you if you uh, want to continue. Well, if there's if there's any questions, I just take perhaps I just take one question. If there is any, yeah. Uh, yeah, good morning, uh, Dr. Kazmi, and uh, thank you for explaining with such lucidity the profound metaphysics and uh, symbolism uh, expounded by Dr. Links. So my question is, mention was made of intellect. Yeah, so am I audible? Uh, not really. Uh, can I uh, I'll just put that? Okay. Yeah, try, try now. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, mention was made of uh, the word intellect. Yeah. Am I now? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, how to reconcile uh, the uh, mention of the word intellect in two traditions? Like, for example, in the Islamic tradition, uh, uh, there is a saying of the Prophet Muhammad upon him be peace and blessings that the first uh, thing that God Allah created was the intellect and in the Christian tradition, uh, I mean, uh, I'm mentioning Meister Eckhart's statement that uh, there is something in man that is uncreated and uncreatable and that is the intellect. So, uh, so which aspect of intellect uh, is Dr. Lynch speaking about in this book? Is, well, is it uncreated or the created according well, to Islamic tradition? Well, yeah. going, going back to your very interesting question, that the creation of the intellect, there's also 
um, a saying that the first thing that God created was the ruh, the spirit. The first thing that God created was the pen, the qalam. You have all of these sayings of the Prophet, والسلام, in which the first creation is given. He also said the first thing God created was my spirit, my own, you know, uh, my reality, my haqiqah. So when Eckhart, on the other hand, talks about the intellect as being in creatum et in creabile, hoc est, you know, aliquid est in anima, in creatum et in creabile, et hoc est intellectus, that there is something in the soul that is uncreated and uncreatable, and this is the intellect. He went on to say, if the whole soul were like it, it would be uncreated. This refers to the inherent duodimensionality. I was about to say ambiguity or ambivalence, but I think duodimensionality is a better way of putting it. There are two dimensions to the spirit, to the intellect, to the Mohammedan reality, to the Logos. And this is expressed very clearly in dogmatic terms in the Christological dogma, which refers to Jesus as having two natures, a divine nature and a human nature, but in one undivided personhood. This is something the mind can hardly make any sense of. And this is where reason itself has to be crucified on the cross, where the mental carapace of rationalistic alternativism, either this or that, has to be cracked, has to be broken. Eckhart said, if you want to reach the essence, you have to break the form. One of the ways in which the form needs to be broken is the formalism of rationality and categorization that will say either black or white, either it's created or it's uncreated. This is where in the Quran it says, Yes, alunaka anil ruh, kulu ruh min amri rabbi. That they ask you about the spirit, what is it? Say back to them. The ruh is from the command of God. You don't know much about it. It's not something that you can actually think about with rational concepts. The ruh that in one sense is created, in another sense is uncreated. The intellect in one sense can be called created, in another sense is uncreated. Meaning it's uncreated in its essence, created in its formal manifestation, as soon as the intellect makes contact with, as soon as these waters of the fountains that flow from the spirit, from the essence ultimately, to the spirit, to the heart, to the soul, as soon as we're talking about the contact between that pure water and the mud of the soul, that mud represents the created element and the pure water represents the uncreated. So in one respect, you're talking about the intellect in the soul as being uncreated because it is the source of that pure uncreated light manifesting in the soul. But insofar as that light is encased by the darkness of human individual formal substance, it becomes a subject to the contingencies of creation. So it becomes, quote, created, the created intellect. So these are just words that I'm trying to put together to convey the extreme complexity of the subject and the inability of the created intellect to understand its own uncreated essence by virtue of any created elements such as formal thought or language. It's impossible. All that can happen is that certain formulations can allow the 
mind, the reason, the created intellect within us, to, as it were, remove the, just like Shuan has given this image, that when you're in a dark room and you open up a shutter and the sun comes into the room, have you created the light of that sun that comes into the room? Have you created the illumination? No, you have just removed a barrier preventing the pre-existing light from coming in. And that is all that we can do with our activities, whether mental or contemplative or spiritual. All we're doing is we are working upon polishing up the heart which contains the uncreated intellect, we're polishing up that heart so that in removing the rust of our own created elements, of our own sins, of our own faults, of our own forgetfulness, in polishing that up with the divine name or with the scriptural revelation, whatever it be that is the weapon that God has put in our hands from heaven, the weapon from heaven to remove the rust of the heart, Whatever it may be, we are bringing to light something that's already there, but it's not through our action that that's created. It's through the pre-existing grace of God that that knowledge is present in our hearts. And all we can do with our mind and our soul and our will and our effort and our concentration and our aspiration is remove the barriers that prevent knowledge from being itself. And here the Imam al-Shadili uh, gives us a very important ishara in one of his, his most famous dua, his, his Hizb al-Bahr. At the beginning of the Hizb al-Bahr of the Imam al-Shadili, we have this statement. We have, Ya Ali wa Ya Adim, Ya Halim wa Ya Alim, Anta Rabbi, Ailmuka Hasbi. He's saying that the, the that you are my Lord and knowledge of you as my Lord is sufficient for me. That's my hasp. It's enough for me. And then he asks for isma. He says, Nas alukal isma ta fil harakati wa sakanati wal kalimati wal iradati wal khatarat. That's an amazing statement if we stop to reflect upon it. He's saying to God, give me isma, give me protection against all of them. In my movements, my harakat, in my stillnesses, my sakinat. Fil harakat wa sakanat wal kalimat in my speech, wal khatarat wal iradat. Now, so from my outward actions to my inward ones, give me protection against it, so that even in my willing and my thinking, wal khatar al khatarat min al shukuk wal dunun wal awham satira til al qulub am mutalaat al ghuyub. Give me protection in my very, in every single one of my thoughts against those doubts, shukuk, wadhunun, and speculations, wal awham, delusions. Protect me in my thinking against those doubts and delusions and illusions and imaginings, which do what? Asatira lil qulub. عن مطالعة الغيوب which prevent the hearts from having the light of knowledge rising up طلوع, like the طلوع الشمس the, the dawn of the sun which is going to give luminous, luminous knowledge regarding غيوب, the things that are hidden meaning that the natural state of the human soul, of the human spirit, is one in which the actions, the stillnesses, the thoughts, desires, iradad, every single aspect of us, outward movements and stillnesses, inward volitions and thoughts, all of them 
are completely protected against those imaginings and delusions and distortions that prevent knowledge of the unseen from rising up like the sun, like dawn in our hearts. So the natural state is one in which there are no shukuk wal dunun wal awham, which are satira, which are covering over the constant rising up of the sun of knowledge in our hearts. That's the natural state of the human being in the Edenic state. So we in our fallen state are calling to God to give us protection against all of these doubts and delusions and imaginings that prevent the rise of knowledge from taking place in our hearts. So there's a long-winded answer to a question, mm-hmm. but um, uh, as I say, the, the, the bridge between reason and the intellect that will help us if we cross this bridge with spiritual intuition that is, is deepened and refined by our reflection, meditation, invocation, contemplation, then our spiritual intuition, which is that bridge linking the soul dominated by reason and the heart dominated by the intellect, that spiritual intuition will help us to understand how, in a wordless way, in a way that goes beyond formal thought and language, how we can understand this mysterious relationship between the created and the uncreated dimensions of the intellect. But it's the spiritual intuition that can do that, and no amount of of words or just idle thought. It's, It's something that's emanating from the soul towards the heart, what Dr. Linz was talking about, an authentic desire for God and the hereafter, which is distinguished from that, those desires that are turned towards the world. So uh, I think we can stop there. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Reza. Thank and, you. Um, I just want to make a quick announcement that yes. we will, um, um, that'll be the last session in April and we will be back uh, from the second, of, uh, second week of May. Second, second week of May. May. All, All right. right. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much.